Hmm. Welcome, 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 aloha. Hmm. Hope aloha. you're all well. It's good to see everybody. <laughs> Make sure you check in with everybody visually if you want to. It's fun how you can tell the temperature by where people are, by what they're wearing. <laughs> Cold in Japan <laughs> or no? Oh, oh, warm, okay. <laughs> Hot. Hmm. Must be cool in Maine, maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's cool in Maine. <laughs> Very windy in Hawaii. Let's sit together as Sangha. If we if we begin with the body, it's the first domain or first pasture of our mindfulness practice. Body, breath, it's the same. Body is a more global, wider field of uh, awareness, free flow awareness. Breath is a more fine pasture. You can find awareness moving into the intricacies of what makes up the body, the elemental nature. Um, so following along the instructions of the mindfulness sutta, we first want to notice our posture, because whether in, we are in formal practice or moving about in daily life, if we, if we train the heart to recognize a body posture as a meditation focal point, then it follows follows us along throughout our life. So even now, some of you are standing, some of you are lying down, uh, some sitting, uh, and then at times some of you walk a little bit, take a few steps, or just moving about. All of this is in the first pasture. first domain of mindfulness. Embodied awareness. So noticing the postures, noticing the little movements and down to the, the elemental level, uh, the solidity 
earth element where we notice textures, hard, soft, smooth, rough, tingly, firmness, lightness, hardness. And the, the aim is direct experiencing, not building a vocabulary of the sensations. And sometimes when we don't know what something is and we realize that instead of focusing on a, the painful sensation, we, we realize it's just intense hardness or pressure or pinpricks. It changes everything. It makes it a meditation instead of a reaction. So in general, just to know that what we call the body is this continually arising and changing dissolving elemental natures, the solidity, the fluidity, the temperatures, the pressure and vibrations. That's what body and breath really are. And that's how we build a great regard, respect, care. And at the same time, through mindfulness, a non-attachment to the body as it really is. It's awakening to have a moment of mindfulness that experiences the body as it really is, this, this first pasture of bodily posture, movements, elements, and their changing nature. And we, we see a second domain, a second pasture, even within the first one. And that's the domain of feelings, mindfulness of feeling tone. What we're experiencing in the body right now, is there an area where the feeling tone is unpleasant? Is there an area where the feeling tone is pleasant or areas where it's neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Feeling tones are a mental phenomena with regard to both physical and mental streams of experience. It's hugely important, which is why the Buddha gave it its own domain of mindfulness. Because no, noticing the difference between a pleasant feeling tone and attachment is a difference between being awake and aware and and being in delusion as well, the difference between an unpleasant feeling tone, just as it is as natural phenomena and the reaction of aversion or ill will, the difference between being aware and having wisdom with regard to the body as opposed to being deluded and aversive. 
see, see for yourself this, can we experience the body as this great Sati Bhattana Sutta was laid out for us, how to be mindful and what is required to be mindful the body as it is, body within the body. It means not shifting to the idea or interpretation of the body, but it's very alive, visceral, immediate nature and feelings as feelings. Not what we think about pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, but their very presence and manifestation as a affective, pleasant feeling tone or unpleasant feeling tone. We may still just be with the body or our home anchor the breath or sound. And discover the third domain, our pasture of mindfulness as chitta, the mind, heart. In the beginning, we discover mind nature through observing thoughts come and go and mental formations and the various mental states, mental moods that come and go. And as the mental and bodily formations become calm and still. We notice this chitta nature as very unique moments of knowing our consciousness appear in order to know a pressure or a vibration or a visual experience, a sound moment, a joy, a grief. And together they, they fall away, the grief and the chitta, the knowing of it the joy and the knowing of it, the sensation of pressure, vibration, and the knowing of it disappear. And the next moment of knowing sees this impermanence and becomes even more awake and wise and connected This is how we enter the pasture of chitta, consciousness, knowing mind. And then finally, and along with body, feeling tone, the heart, mind, Chitta nature is the fourth domain of dhammas, generally meaning phenomena. In particular, here, what is emphasized in our practice is the cultivation 
sustaining and maturing of the awakening factors, the energizing factors, the calming or tranquilizing awakening factors and mindfulness itself. In order to be successful with that, we also need to know the hindrances and the dis distraction that sense desire or sleepiness or anger, restlessness, doubt can bring about. The aim is to understand their nature, what causes them to arise, what causes them to cease. And the answer is always in, in mindfulness and clear comprehension. So every time we're mindful, we're practicing the abandonment of hindrances and the nurturing of the awakening factors and an understanding of the sense spheres. We call this practice the six sense door awareness practice, whether it's mindfulness or metta and the Brahma Viharas. This, this fourth domain of dhammas is inclusive of knowing seeing from within the experience of seeing and hearing from within, within the hearing phenomena. And the touch feeling of the body and the mind knowing of the heart. to practice in this way without attachment or aversion, without clinging to anything in the world. We're cultivating the curiosity and compassion uh, to sustain along these domains, these conditions for mindfulness body, feelings, consciousness, and the dhammas, the particular phenomena that aid awakening. Please see for yourself what's true.
Steve, do you want to um, say a few words about the four foundations first, and then me, or you're you're in the lead? <laughs> My, my experience of putting to practice these uh, four domains, mindfulness, is that they're inclusive of all our experience. The, the, the sutta, the discourse is actually quite detailed in speaking about the experience of each of these, each of these domains or pastures, body, feelings, mind, and dhammas or phenomena to be known internally, externally, both internally and externally. There's different views of what that means, uh, but I think it's safe to say it can, it, it can mean both internal to our own body-mind system, and as we observe in others. It can also mean um, the interior of our experience versus the exterior of our experience, like the senses have uh, the expression of the appearance of a visual experience external to the interior of the eye and auditory experience external to the interior of the ear and so forth. Um, I think it doesn't matter and it's actually brings more detail and more inclusivity so that there's, there's nothing outside of the domain of our meditative world. What we do from the moment we awaken um, to the moment we fall asleep is all a meditation um, and how we relate to people because part of the part of the sutta, the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, is knowing when we speak, knowing when we're silent, and therefore paying attention relationally to everything we interface with, other beings and objects and so forth. There's just no transaction in life that doesn't become an intimate part of our, of our inner understanding and a part of our awakening. So we take care to and are aware of speaking to understand or to be understood or speaking softly or harshly or uh, catching when we're, when a, a thought or sequence of speech arises out of delusion or clarity, that's the kind of detail uh, this practice brings to us. Uh, and whether we're uh, doing our household chores, cleaning and cooking and so forth, corresponding with somebody, uh, having friends and family over and so forth. The meditation is always happening for us. Uh, and it's not displayed, it's not at, at all particularly obvious. Uh, it's just a presence and an awareness. In fact, the patana of sati patana, one translation, is the presence of mind. Sati, that pre-verbal awareness or remembering as a full presence of mind. Uh, and to always have that full presence of mind, to, to stand upon the moment. Tana means to stand, patana, to this presence of mind standing in this moment is a powerful way to live. 
and a powerful way to influence others that uh, have our own sense of presence and to present ourselves as present is very respectful with regard to other beings and they take they feel seen other people other living beings feel acknowledged so it's, a, it's kind of a beautiful it's a beautiful thing to understand the inner workings of our practice certainly in a silent way all the more powerful in a silent way and as michelle said spoke of last week you know when you when you bring the composure of compassion and the expansion of metta and the uplifting of, of joy mudita uh, and the soothing stability of equanimity uh, which we do side by side with these four domains of mindfulness there really is nothing left out it's a beautiful expression it's a beautiful flowering of our heart that was my intention in kind of guiding us through uh, without being too clunky with you know all the details of internal external or both um, and with regard to feelings feelings in regard to bodily sensation mental phenomena or feelings in regard to the six sense doors it's quite detailed uh, but i was just wanting to give a little a broad brush stroke of the of the sutta the actual discourse uh, to guide us into the sitting that was my intention not not to provide all all the detail as interesting as it is So I could add a little more with that and then we can take questions. Does that sound good? I didn't hear it. Oh, the first can, part cut out. Yeah, I can add a little something yeah. more to that, but not much. And then we can take questions. Great. Um, Lovely. Yeah, I was thinking of sort of, um, I think what's interesting is that last week and this week, the four foundations uh, the teachings of them are coming in before the retreat we're doing the month long next month and it's it's interesting it's like they, it's just very strong um, for us and uh, because it's um, in, in America it's Independence Day I think uh, you know some hot times like if it's Valentine's Day or we'll we'll speak a little bit about Meta I think that um, there are many, many, many um, facets to the word independence and in, in relationship to freedom and, and the, the kind of levels to which as human beings we struggle. We've, we've struggled many, many generations of struggle uh, on a political or social economic level you know, so the, the just the racial, the range of um, struggle for independence, uh, gender, you know, it's so vast. Uh, and the, the, the kind of intent of the Buddha with the four foundations um, was uh, very deeply the, the, the sense that freedom is possible. And, and I found that um, the greatest gift for me in the practice was starting to see that I was actually, uh, particularly with Upandita, said Upandita, when I first did a long retreat with him, I saw this um, very, very gradual, like very, very slow 
um, training with each of these foundations of mindfulness. And, and, and before that, it had been uh, much uh, less clear to me that um, the direction of the practice was including all four, not just getting good at one or two. You know, like, of course, I think sometimes it can seem too much when we first start practicing. But I think what Steve was just saying about this, um, this inclusivity of these teachings in terms of what we're actually paying attention to, what the, the goal is that we can be um, free, truly independent and free and connected with every moment of experience so that there really truly is no part left out. And, and as I started to understand that breadth and depth of the, um, <laughs> you know, what freedom really is, you know, I started to see that anything that I couldn't have a relationship of mindfulness or loving kindness or any Brahma Vihara with, um, that that's, that was a, a kind of exclusion, of exclusivity, and that I was oppressed by that. I was actually oppressed by that. And it was so painful to start seeing that wherever I couldn't have a relationship with any experience, that was where I was losing that freedom and independence. Uh, so so kind of going to that deeper level as we go through the levels of um, kind of the very painful, extremely painful, obvious places in, in our human world where the controller, the controlling or the oppressor and the controlled plays out so uh, intensely and painfully that that within us, what the Buddha was was really teaching with us was how to um, liberate ourselves inwardly, and that in that liberation you free everybody. It's like that. You, every single moment, every sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, every relationship, it's like, yeah, the, the little me, the greed, hatred, and delusion is gone. You're free. You know, and it, it's such a powerful, um, I think that it's such a powerful intention to realize how much we want to be free. And how much we want to bring that to, to the world, the, you know, the liberation and the compassion and the, um, to encourage the search and the longing, to, to value that longing. So the, the, the more we have the training and the ability to be with whatever's present, um, <laughs> the less we need to control the less oppression there is. And, and we see with some of the leaders that just want complete, total control, right? How insane it is, but how it can be so predominant. And then you see so many of us, so many beings are going in the other direction, you know, which the Buddha did say was against the stream, but it's like how um, awesome it is to even know it's possible <laughs> and when we taste it as Steve says you know in the instruction you taste it and you're like oh you know awakening is possible you know, so I, I that I don't know how much I had a few other things maybe two I think that um Often when we think of the word independence, there's a kind of separateness that we can um, conjure up in that. And, I, you know, I think of like when we're born, you know, and that, you know, that the amount of, of work, the parenting it takes to bring a, a being into this world and um, create this movement from dependence to independence. Yeah. And I have... 
I have, a, for some reason, a number of friends that are having their high school kids graduate this year. And then, so we're in the summer right before <laughs> they're going off. And it's fascinating to kind of just see the, um, that level of just that movement toward this more independence of the, the um, teenager and what it's like for the parents and, and that like it's it's um, I was talking to one of my neighbors this morning that were going through a lot around it and I was just saying you know you were such good parents you're such good parents and you have created such roots for your child here like such a deep healthy roots that he he want he can explore he wants to explore. He can explore. It's like, this is this is what you've done for this being, you know. And <laughs> mother was crying, and she's like, but he's he's going off, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And that's like part of the growth. It's like when when whenever we have a growth, whether we're my age, seventy, almost, or like. 17 or 18 it's like there is a great grief process where we're we're daring we're bold enough we're courageous enough to expand what we don't know and we do that with the four foundations so maybe i remember i i really started with hearing in my practice that's all i could do for years practicing being aware of hearing mostly and then starting to notice unpleasant pleasant neutral and then that started being able to shift to body sensations. And then eventually I had to start facing aversion, right? Like, and of course, then there's delusion or, you know, but it wasn't like I could do it all at once. It's just like this gradual opening and often that shifting to like, oh, there's enough energy to start expanding and exploring with something else. This is how freedom happens. This, this, this enough energy, the patience, the, the staying where, with where you are and strengthening that and then the patience to open. And I, I'll just, you know, I'm just kind of mentioning ideas, not developing them entirely here, but I wanted to um, end just with a poem by uh, somebody I've been reading a lot uh, the late poems of Wang on Shi. And uh, hmm. yeah, the reason today this one came up was um, this poet who lived 1021 to 1086, uh, he had spent his so much of his life. Uh, working so hard to take care of people. And he, he had the ear of the emperor in China at this period, 1021, 1021 to 1086, probably the middle years of his life for some years. And he wanted to practice so much. And he was so clear about how good he was at trying to help people, like not just... Um, the aristocracy at that time. And he, he knew he was the right person at the right time. The emperor did, he did so much um, before there was a huge reaction against it and the emperor died. But in that time period, he longed and yearned so much to practice. And he finally, in the last 10 years of his life, he got to practice. And in the, in the, in the book, you, you see him getting quiet, and you, 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 through the poetry, you see him awakening. And there's one poem, it's probably in the middle of those 10 years I wanted to share. It's called Wandering at Delight Mind Pavilion, sent to my sister in Chen Chao. So th the background of this is he hasn't seen his sister for a very, very long time. Like he's been off reclusive, um, in the mountains at some monasteries. Um, so this is important. This is sent to his sister. Skies exquisite, 
clearing over a thousand peaks and 10,000 miles of rain-soaked autumn clarity. Heaven star river cascading, flooding down through an incandescent mirror of moon. It rinses eye and spirit away, leaving only body and shadow. Who wouldn't grieve in this far end of darkness? Isolate mystery may deepen, but I still long to see you wandering toward me. It's like freedom includes missing people. It includes the connection. It includes everything, no part left out. He was coming to grips with missing, not, not necessarily having to do anything about it, but valuing it. It's like he included another part of himself and his care for his sister. It's like that might not be um, maybe that we have to face, um, have a willingness to face fear, but what, why I brought it up was because of in terms of independence and connection, it's like it's a koan. It's a koan, this dance between um, that inward practice and the outward practice and the connections. I think that um, we're very fortunate to have the Dhamma and to learn what freedom really is in relationship to that. So, do you have any questions about the instructions or Stephen's talk, my little talk? Just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, the easiest way is to um, click the button at the bottom of your screen that says raise hands, might be in the reactions button there. Um, if you can't figure that out, you can just type into the chat that you have a question and we'll make sure to call in. And Hey, Carol, you should be able to unmute yourself. Mm. Okay. So um, notice my uh, t-shirt. Every child matters. So July 1st, of course, was Canada Day. And Seashell, where I live, and many other cities canceled Canada Day. And what we did instead is we marched with um, the, the Aboriginal people that live in our communities. And our little town is um, about 30,000 people on the coast. And there were a thousand of us walking. And it was, um, what's happened is I have such appreciation for the four Brahma Viharas uh, that you worked with us with. And it's been a year and a half of isolation. Uh, and it, all of a sudden there's a thousand people. And it's, uh, it's sad. And it's, um, you know, there's this real sense of we're all together and incredible love. And it's, um, it's giving me uh, tingly all over right now, just even talking about it. You know, COVID has, um, and sitting every Sunday and doing your retreats, it's, it's transformative, but you don't notice it <laughs> until, until things start to change. And so being with a thousand people, and then today I was uh, walking in the woods with Tom and came upon a woman whose husband, um, he was, in, there was no bit in the paper, uh, he just died, but he's had Alzheimer's for quite a while and he couldn't hear and he was wandering off and she was a caregiver. 
And she met someone who also had a wife who had Alzheimer's who died. And, and it was just this joy for them. It was such an incredible feeling and being able to, to share it with them in the woods. And then he's saying, well, I had the same experience she did. And so, it, you know, it was just like saying, it's so wonderful that you can have this moment of happiness. And, and I think what I want to say is, before I might have been happy for them, but it wouldn't have been as big or as, um, there wouldn't have been quite the openness with me. And it was, and I just want to thank you uh, all for uh, being here and sort of letting these things perk along. <laughs> so it's not really a, a question, it's more appreciation. Thank you. Oh, there's so much in what you shared and really appreciate it. I think um, I did see something about um, not, not only was July 1st canceled, but that there's that, that a lot of people knew that that wasn't enough and that there's a great mobilization happening uh, among a lot of people in Canada. And I, I think it's so uh, moving and important and it, it can't be enough. It's just like the beginning of trying to heal a tremendous um, atrocity and, and the grief around it. So I, I feel like, uh, and, and the thing that you mentioned with Alzheimer's again, it's like to have Sangha and to have, all the practice we've been doing and the isolation, the pandemic. I mean, there's so much that you brought up and to see that through all the, um, the difficult side of, of, of this that I have felt that the Sunday sits uh, and uh, have been extraordinary, you know. Um, it's like getting carried through with the Sangha and um, the retreat, so yeah. There's a lot more I could say, but I appreciate that you appreciate it. And I think Mudita, Mudita particularly has that quality of um, like a vast joy that can be balanced with the equanimity that yes, things have been as they are <laughs> this last 17 months, you know, things are as they are the, the last uh, hundreds of years, you know, however, perspective, etc. cetera, um, the, the mudita for the joys, it's not, pers it doesn't have to be personal. It can be vast and beautiful. So thank you, Carol. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was moved by, at a certain point, you, you said, Previously, you would have been happy for them, but now you felt a part of that happiness. You felt the interconnection, the inclusivity, the sameness, that that shift was huge. It is huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, thank, thank you for you. that. Mm, thank you.
I just will add, I, it's really good to hear about the march and just, um, I hope there's much more. I hope so much more can be done. So thanks, Carol. David and Gloria, I saw you for a second. <laughs> yeah, this is Gloria. Um, well, Michelle, I just, um, I really appreciated your um, segue into um, independence and separateness and, and your example of a teenager, you know, growing up and, and moving away and in me just felt these tears arise, um, even though it's been, you know, 12 years since Maya, you know, left home for college. Um, and there was so much, at the time, there was so much fear that, you know, um, that I was like losing her to the world. And, um, and, you know, my experience has been just that we remain very close and connected um, because, you know, I think we did provide her with that strong foundation of feeling safe and secure to go out in the world and discover who she was and be separate. Yeah, yeah. But it's still, you know, kind of, a little surprising that it's still a little tender, you know, in my heart right here. Yeah. Steve, do you want us to respond first or do you want me to? When I hear those emotions expressed, you know, tenderness, um, sadness, a certain kind of sorrow. I think, I think first of um, Mahasi Sayadaw in Burma, who spoke of emotions in that context as, um, as healthy sorrow and healthy sadness, healthy grief, because they're they're in a larger context of of unconditional love or wisdom, understanding, and, and so like even though there's, I, I felt a slight hesitation when you said, you know that was twelve years ago, but still now you still feel this tenderness. But that's a good tenderness. That's a that's a beautiful tenderness. It's a it's a dhamma tenderness, which is how Mahasi would express those. It was a, a Dhamma sadness or a Dhamma struggle when we're having a hard time in our practice, putting it in a good light and framing it in a way that to feel good about those difficult emotions. Not that we should feel bad about the other ones, um, but, th but these actually are empowering and, and fill out our heart and fill out our, our nature in really rich, good ways. Thank you. Steve. Thank you for saying that. That's very helpful to hear it framed that way. Say that again, Gloria. Um, I was just saying that it was very helpful to hear or hear that framed that way as a, you know, um, it, that it's, it's a positive thing that I still have this 
sadness, this tenderness, um, these emotions that are still strong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was helpful, helpful to me when I heard that because I, I had previously felt that it was a, a sign that I wasn't progressing mm. to, to feel that struggle or sadness or grief or even fear in the context of our work, of our practice is a Dhamma fear, a healthy fear, a, you know, a fear that carries us further along in opening the heart and bringing wisdom to the mind. Yeah, so it's good to say it out loud for others to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think that's why, even though I, that poem, it was written, you know, so long ago, but it's like, I felt like that, that expresses that sense of like, maybe he felt what Stephen, you're saying, like uh, this twinge, like maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't be missing my sister, right? Like, you know, here's this exquisite wisdom and emptiness and, you know, the skies have cleared over 10,000 peaks. That's a metaphor, right? For his mind, right? Awakening. And yet he was missing his sister. And I think that that's so important that that's valued. I remember when my sister died and I was struggling with this, um, same issue that the the grief and the missing and then I realized wait wait a minute missing is happening in the present moment I'm not caught in the past like I'm in the present being mindful of missing and it all that all that feeling that it wasn't healthy just dropped away it was just like I could just connect with the missing of course of course I missed her <laughs> Just like, of course, you miss your daughter, you know, and so I think that that it's helpful to hear that Mahasi framed it that way, you know, it, it helps us to um, understand no part left out. Yeah. Michelle, you're muted there. Um, I just because um, I think that that sense of the existential predicament of being born, right? Where <laughs> we're born and you know we perceive we have this perception of ourselves as being separate, and others perceive us as separate, and that connection to a mother or a parent and or a sibling like the that sense of like when we start to um take it takes many months of infancy to start finding that we are a separate self right you're not born knowing that you're a separate self or 
you know, it's like it's boundless when you're born. So I think that um, that that these these kind of deeper emotional aspects of exploring independence and freedom and like a, the healthy dependence and the unhealthy dependence, you know, or the healthy independence, all that is, um, it's so rich. It's so rich in explore, explore, exploration in terms of um, this practice. The depth of it is, is teaching us that separation is a misperception. We're misperceiving reality. We're misperceiving reality. And uh, that the care and the delicacy of attention that can start getting quiet enough to see how, how the mind moves to create separation. A and again, acknowledging what we're trying to say, you know, in this talk and the instruction, everything, when we go through these stages of life, I think that that one stage uh, that a number of our friends are going through with their kids it is so is so poignant and how we navigate that ourselves as teenagers and how we navigate it and help others I, I think is in all on all in many ways so culturally important never mind spiritually important so just, just wanted to add that that, that there's a deep level of um, Hopefully, you feel inspired <laughs> to keep exploring that inwardly, you know, this week as, uh, as we start to fade away out of the Zoom at some point. Harry. Harry, you're muted there. Some, some interesting coincidences. I was reading the, the New York Times today and there was a, a long story on Joni Mitchell's the 50th anniversary of the Blue Album. And one of the songs in there Little Green, I never realized this, but it was about her giving a child up for adoption, which is another kind of, that's a separation. And um, I was I was overwhelmed with it. And I remembered two women I know that had given children up for adoption and how poignant it was for them to talk about never letting go. Every year on their birthday, the child's birthday, they would go through some stuff and I just, uh, I can't, I can't really relate to what it's like to carry someone within you and then to say goodbye to that person, whether you're reunited later on. Or, and and uh, so those feelings were pretty overwhelming today and brought back a lot of feelings about time I spent in Canada of all places, here we go. And um, I, I had trouble being with that and actually had to turn to, uh, in the midst of all this kind of strange nostalgia, um, not really strange, the Brahma Viharas, the, 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 the Karuna, and, and that made it a little lighter and made it, made it, made it move, and, uh, it moved in that process. In any case, uh, I'm so glad that you guys taught us the Brahma Viharas. Thank you. They soften the heart. They can help soften the heart so that things can move. You know, when something stays stuck, it can't move. And it, it's a, one of our primary reasons for teaching the Brahma Viharas or what you just expressed, Harry. So 
it's a pleasure and joy to see how much it's um, allowing for that process of um, opening and strength to happen. It's very joyful to hear. Also, in dealing with the the, uh, the judgment that comes, that uh, maybe as like that monk, I shouldn't be feeling this at this point. I should be able to get past this and get into the big picture. I've known a number of people in Sangha over the years and they experience a loss and people do it as they do it. But it has always struck me as curious that some will just say, well, it's just part of the process of life. And it, it seems so delusional. It seemed delusional not to have emotion when you lose your partner in 50 years. It, it, it's, 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 maybe you're not paying attention enough. Maybe you're an enlightened master, but I think I need to pay attention to what's going on with me regardless of what I should be doing. I, just, I don't know if you guys are going to respond to Harry there, but I did, Gloria brought up something. Michelle, when you sort of said that the Zoom meditations are fading oh, out. No, I meant just, um, I meant that there were, it didn't seem like there were any more questions. So I thought we were fading. <laughs> so I was going to say one last thing. So I'm sorry that it was, uh, it, came, it came across that way. Yeah, we're going to keep doing Zoom. So thanks, Jesse, for bringing it up, you know. Thanks for ask. Thanks for mentioning it. That would be exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> Separation anxiety. Great, Glory. Thank you, Glory. Yeah. It could be good practice. We'd be like, oh. Yeah, but no, we're we're not stopping. We we love it. We love this. It's so important. And Steve, did you want to respond to Harry? I don't know if it's a direct response, but what came to mind as you were talking was um, an interview I had uh, in the eighties with Upandita, long retreat that we were doing, Brahma Vihara, Brahma Vihara and Vipassana. And, um, I came in for the interview and, and I just started, I was just weeping, tears were pouring down my face. And he looked at me for a while and he says, there's different kinds of tears. He said, one is environmental, like onions, garlic, and he said, then there are tears of sadness. And then there are tears of joy. And some tears of joy are with attachment. Some tears of joy are without attachment, Dhamma tears. And just in that little interchange, I, I experienced the entire, the whole world of emotion. kind of Zen postage stamp of emotion.
I would just um, amplify that, that I think we all can have this like mythology or misunderstanding that somehow if we're, we are very connected but are enlightened that the heart won't hurt if something we love passes. And, and I think that's such a misunderstanding that if you really care and love a being or the earth or however it is, one's own body that the Brahma Vihara and the mindfulness practice is meant to help us feel the the pain of that, right? Like the Harry, you said it beautifully, it, the Brahma Vihara has helped it move, right? That's all you need to know. It helps it move. It will move, but to not, <laughs> not feel at the least that it's painful if something that you care about passes it. Um, I think that's a misunderstanding. That's the heart. The heart is an incredible instrument and it will hurt. And then the equanimity will come and um, when out of that, there'll be that quiet acceptance that things are as they are, that, that things are impermanent. But that will include the pain of the passing. So it's, it's always good to get reminded of that as I think a lot of our conditioning was that somehow we were going to get rid of pain and sadness and <laughs> grief. If we were like, you know, it's a, it's a great idea. We, we're not going to hurt anymore. <laughs> the heart won't hurt or feel joy. If it's not going to feel pain, it's sad. It's not going to feel joy, but these things will just, they all, you know, get transformed into the Brahma Viharas and liberation. Yeah. So. Well, we hope you have a mellow, lovely, beautiful week. And uh, yes, we are continuing with the Sunday sittings. <laughs> we'll see you next Sunday. And the practice is always with you. Mm.